main point is uh, how we balance uh, risk and growth for SMEs. So um, um, I think uh, the the we will break up the presentation into uh, four components. The definition of SME because I think uh, the basics are important in terms of how we define uh, uh, what is SME and what is not. And what we will observe is the definition varies widely. Um, given that we look at let's say India and also countries which are outside, we uh, have been able to select let's say what is sort of a global definition of SME. Then we're going to move into let's say the component of demand and supply. I'll switch on my pointer so that it's easy to understand. And uh, let's say in the element of demand and supply, uh, what are the factors which impact the demand for SME lending and what are the supply factors which influence it? Uh, then we're going to get into some of the lending practices that we observe and then a quick recap uh, in terms of what we do. I'll try to keep the presentation, let's say, as short as possible um, by covering, of course, all the points uh, so that we have some time for uh, getting into questions. Okay, so let's say uh, the definition of SMEs uh, um, is there is no universally accepted uh, definition. I mean, it's, it's very loose, right? Uh, there are multiple uh, definitions which exist with, by country and by players. The government authorities give one, the banks give one, the statistical institutes give one, and of course, the service providers also have their own version of it. Um, but let's say if you look at all the chaos in terms of defining what something is, um, typically it gets into, let's say, the number of employees, the, uh, the, it should have the industry or sector they're coming to, the size of the revenue, the, their asset size, the capital they have invested or their legal status. Um, it, it's more or less hovers around these parameters. Um, <clears throat> if I look at, let's say, the different regions in terms of, let's say, what the, uh, uh, SMEs uh, really uh, are uh, they tagged as uh, uh, when we look at Europe, basically it is driven by the number of employees and turnover. There is typically no differentiation by the sectors. Uh, in India, it is based on investments of 25 lakh to 10 crore for manufacturing and 10 lakh to 5 crore for services. In the US, again, it is similar to Europe where is based on the employees and turnover, but they have a very, very granular industry differentiation. Uh, in China, again, uh, number of employees, turnover, and they also incorporate assets, and they use different thresholds for uh, the seven different sectors, more or less, that's what they've categorized it as. Uh, what are the peculiarities that we, let's say, observe? Um, so essentially, they're small in size, they're a the number is very high, which is why we are all interested, let's say, and they have, given that they're micro, but the volume is so high, have a large impact on the economy. So, vast majority of them are SMEs, that's for sure, right? Uh, they have a large percentage of the workforce employed, job creation, and uh, and it's and it's a very, very good co like contributor to the economy. They're very heterogeneous, right? I mean, uh, uh, they're very very different although they are like a big volume and that is what we really observe and that is why the ability to identify them and tag the risk correctly and also the growth opportunity is very very complicated they do have a very high risk of failure so let's say they are doing a huge amount of let's say uh, benefit to the economy and to the growth but they also come with a high risk of failure specifically the first couple of years or when they are into the operation uh, we also observe that there is a government support that is typically there in order to support them in the best possible way, the ecosystem. The challenge always is access to credit and that is why we are also interested in how to enable and let them make it easier for them to access to credit. And there is also in general a lack of data availability but I am sure as we all know given the account aggregators and the GST and the Bureau that is something that is slowly changing and the, the the main element is that how best we can use these sources of data in order to underwrite uh, the, 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 the SME as a whole uh, sector in the best possible form. <coughs> so given the peculiarities, the challenge, I mean, let's say there are top six challenges, let's say what we can um, understand. Uh, formal credit continues to be a problem. I mean, given everything, let's say, that is there, there is still an issue in, in terms of them in getting access to formal credit. 
um, they are subjected to more complex procedures for accessing credit versus uh, others, which is another problem. Um, the third is, let's say, uh, when we assess an SME, uh, there is, I mean, the promoters probably would have a huge no knowledge on a particular area, but are weak in other areas, and hence there is a likelihood of the the, the particular entity not being very very successful. Um, given that, let's say they have limited resources and let's say uh, the financial structure is fragile or volatile as they start off, they're highly impacted by economic condition, right? We are seeing right now for COVID. So that is there. Um, if, let's say, competition decides to flex their muscles against them, I mean, uh, they, fall, they would easily fall prey to that given, given um, the, 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 the initial period when the scale is size. And of course, let's say, I mean, it is in general that they are operating and optimizing using very, very limited resources. So whatever we do, we need to be cognizant of the peculiarities and the challenges that these sectors has, and then let's say take a decision in how to move forward. Because otherwise, uh, uh, the, our ability to, let's say, uh, help them in the best possible form does not exist. So let's say, given that these challenges and peculiarities do exist, right? Let's, let's look at the demand the supply for credit from their standpoint um, just to let's say have a view so what are the demand side right and how basically they choose a letter right pricing tenure and fees i mean i think this is after let's say going through the administrative hassle going through all the data document submission and so on and so forth one of the major challenges that they face is that higher pricing or maybe lower tenure or maybe a high fee that they need to pay for getting a loan. I think uh, there is this is standard. There is no real analytics that goes or let's say consulting that goes behind this in order to let's say really have a prudent risk-based pricing or a prudent optimization on the tenure that should be given to them for pay down of their loans. So I think this is one part where uh, this is one of the things that really influence the demand. The second is that uh, although there is a Search in India for low ticket unsecured loans. Most of the loans to the SMEs are always collateralized. And uh, this is a problem because, let's say, there is a, I mean, you are asking me to, uh, let's say, uh, study, but you are, I mean, uh, you're standing with the ruler beside me. If I do one mistake, you're going to pounce on me. So I think there is a issue in terms of collateralizing the loan sometimes in terms of on the demand side. Time to disbursement. This is purely on the tag that we have today from, let's say, a day a particular SME applies for a loan until when we are able to disburse it. Um, so clearly, uh, there is no benchmark um, and no clarity given to the SMEs in terms of how the disbursal process is working. And I think that is also one of the major elements on the demand side, which influences in terms of the loan. And the last is, of course, how accessible. Are you, is the creditor? I mean, is it is it enough that they let's say uh, they are able to reach out in the right time in order to let's say get the credit or not? So accessibility becomes also uh, a major constraint on the demand side. Um, if I look, if I switch to the supply side, right? Uh, so how do the lenders in general evaluate an SME. Um, you would look at, let's say, uh, with what is the background experience net worth and so on and so forth for the promoter. You would look at the fin uh, financials of the, of the SME, uh, the credit history from the bureau, the, 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 their balance sheets, their PNL, uh, the bank statements that they will get from, and of course now the GST uh, data is also there. So all these are data sources that you would evaluate in terms of from a financial standpoint. From a non-financial standpoint, you would look at, let's say, the futuristic goals that they have, the kind of supplies that they have. Is it one supplier where the risk of supply is very high or is it spread across multiple where, let's say, if one supplier fails, the other one. The same where, where you're selling, let's say, the good, whether there's one buyer or multiple buyer, uh, do you uh, go for a side verification? Is that required, which also costs and so on and so forth. 
again, the last component is the industry and the market where let's say, how do you look at the industry where the SME is playing and whether the industry as such, again, given the COVID, we would, let's say, evaluate right now, anyone in the travel industry or anyone in the airline industry, there is no point in, let's say, supporting them for anything. So industry plays a real part, but this is more macro in nature versus micro, because I mean, this would allow you to, let's say, evaluate a particular industry and you shut it down versus lending anyone to anyone in that particular industry. So this is more macro, whereas uh, these elements are more micro in nature. So once, let's say, we looked at, again, uh, the peculiarities and the challenges and then the demand and the supply, um, I think it's also a key question after we look at this, why do they really struggle to pay? Um, because again, let's say you look at everything, their demand was met, supply was met, you took care of the challenges, but still you find, let's say specifically from a customer management standpoint, once you've given the loan, they're struggling to pay, right? Uh, it could be multiple internal factors in financial. I mean, they have a poor working capital management, financial position is going weaker uh, on a, let's say a month on month basis. Uh, they don't have, adequate accounting controls that they put in and let's say there is a, a I mean so essentially finan plan the financials very very well then there are external factors which are let's say pricing is higher shorter maturities and so on and so forth and highly impacted by market and industry forces and on the internal factors not financial management the management itself is weak I mean it could be that let's say there are uh, only one promoter and he's constrained in terms of doing multiple things. Maybe there are two to three promoters who are there and then they have a fight internally. And, and these are some things which are really not in the control of, of let's say, a lender in terms of why, when they decide to give a loan to someone at the time of, let's say, origination. Um, so at the end of the day, there is an hesitation that, let's say, uh, to lend right and at the end of the day the hesitation is purely because we are taking in high credit risk um, reliability of information the pnl and the balance sheet that it might be giving or let's say uh, the, the the side verification it might not really be helpful the banking statement might could also not be helpful and he might be giving us only one bank statement where there are others plus specifically in this segment let's say whether the individual risk needs to be considered as along with the company risk also needs to be evaluated and that is also uh, a pertinent issue um, there might not be any record on the bureau i mean that is another problem that we have uh, the financial position could have weakened uh, lower profits from um, i mean so typically what you've observed let's say that your profits are lower while you're lending to the segment versus retail let's say as a as a comparison so why let's say would we get into this where the profits are lower so i mean this is one one of the these are more or less the standard hesitations that you would have in lending out to the SME segment so i mean what could be the best practices where which takes into account the peculiarities the the challenges the demand and the supply constraints and let's say the the, the hesitations that lenders would have in order to give them and I think I also need to touch on COVID giving a scenario where let's say, how do we change the solution because of COVID? So, uh, I mean, as we, as we go through the flow of the presentation, you would observe that there is no COVID specific slides. The reason there is no COVID specific slides is because, I mean, our understanding and our recommendation is that do not do any fundamental and core changes because of COVID. It is unnecessary, it is not required. Uh, invest in your core uh, risk solutions and platforms and growth as you would if there was no COVID. So your core system remains as is. Then, because of COVID, because we don't have data, you overlay some rules on the top of it to take care of the solution. So for example, you decide not to lend to someone who is in the travel industry. That's an overlay on a typical core logic. But do not, let's say, uh, do drastically something else for uh, uh, looking at from a COVID scenario. Okay. Uh, why? Because in three months, six months, down uh, 10 months, 
the COVID scenario would lift up. Once it lifts, your core system needs to get back into action. So then we don't want you to again change everything back to, let's say, what could be a new core after the COVID is over, right? So maintain the core system as you would have if this was no COVID. And then overlay on the top of that some other policies, some other rules, which you feel more coming from an experience and from a discussion base, which is more commonsensical because there is really no data to substantiate anything in terms of how to control the COVID uh, surge of risk or the risk for moratorium takers or opt-ins who might not be evacuated on. So I'll move on to the so 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 the next phase of the presentation would focus fundamentally on how can you enhance the core because that is the long-term sense on the overlay on terms of the core I, I will we can discuss let's say what could be the potential elements that we can do but the main element still remains is what you would do to underwrite an SME or let's say to uh, manage an SME if there was no COVID. <clears throat> so you need a very, very robust workflow. I mean, I'm sure you already have. Uh, they might have some pros and cons, but the, the, there are four components which are very, very important. It needs to manage end-to-end -end processing of applications. This has to be end-to-end. -end. Otherwise, the workflow, if there is a break in the workflow, it is a break in the process. And then there is some manual intervention. So you need to, let's say, automate it end-to-end. -end. The second is that it has to manage the multiple roles and users uh, who are, uh, which are, which are the part of your teams, operations, credit risk, uh, uh, finance, and so on and so forth, who are uh interacting with the workflow while you are taking a decision to let <clears throat> storing data that you are using to underwrite is paramount right because let's say uh if you reject 50 guys out of 100 that applies today or 40 guys that hundred today you really need to store the data of those 40 it cannot be that you have you store only the data of the only 60 that you approve because the reject population is later used to mine what is the right way to authorize. Even if you don't, let's say, use all data uh, for underwriting, but you believe that some of the data components can be helpful from a futuristic standpoint, it is important to save them and save them digitally. Um, if let's say there are operators who are manually entering data fields that you capture on paper, try and modify that and move to a digital process. <clears throat> Integration to all other systems has to happen over API uh, and, and that is, let's say, mandatory. So I believe that, let's say from a workflow standpoint, these are the four rules that you need to be governed with. Once the workflow is there, and, and the workflow is critical because this is also the let's say your brain in terms of how do you want to design the process and also has a direct influence on the turnaround time where the SMEs are very very concerned with uh, plus also the transparency in which you are lending. Once the workflow is taken care of you move to the decision engine where let's say you need to have a central brain which is a system to manage all your policies, all your scorecards, and at an enterprise level, which covers not only your underwriting, but also your customer management. So it should have the capability of housing and executing multiple scorecards. It should have, let's say, uh, uh, house all the business rules and the policy reject rules. It has to be together. And then it can do, uh, it, 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 it needs to compute everything and give back, let's say, uh, decisions and it has the ability to make multiple uh, decision making calls. The key point here is that <clears throat> let's say 100 applications comes to you today. Your policy and business rules reject 20, 80 remains. Your scorecard goes to those 80 and let's say uh, 60 remains and it rejects another 20. But we don't know if let's say you would have run the scorecard on the base where you would have rejected someone by the policy would you have approved them or not or 
But this we know given that there is a hierarchy where rules are run first and then the scorecards. So for sure what the scorecards rejects, it would also, it is approved by the policy. We know that. But I think it is relevant to see a grid where your policy declines someone and your score approves or vice versa where your score declines someone and your policy approves because that again would help you in refining your policy rules and scorecards from an underwriting standpoint. And the only way you would be able to do this is that at least from a system standpoint, you have a very, very robust decision engine to allow you to compute it in a later way in that particular structure. Um, <clears throat> needless to say, uh, I've also seen a lot of challenges with the way you are naming rules or the way you are outputting, let's say, the rules in order to manage them digitally where it becomes mineable analytically at a later date. You need to have a very, very clear rule naming uh, methodology. You need to have a very, very clear rule output methodology that can be tracked again digitally for letter mining in order to give you intelligence at your marginal zone where you approve or decline. So I think these are core components. And I mean, I believe it makes sense that you invest in them heavily in order to make sure that you manage the demand and the supply side in a very, very meaningful manner. And I think this is what probably would give you more competitive intelligence uh, or competitive uh, advantages than anything else. Capture data. So on the data side, uh, again, let's say you are taking into account multiple data, right? And let's say uh, some of them are qualitative, some of them are quantitative, some of them are financial, some of them are non-financial. You are managing, you are leveraging internal and external, and uh, you are making sure that you capture the data on screen to show something to whatever your underwriters want to see. Um, the key point is, if I go through, let's say, the flow of someone applying, you have an application form. Uh, you, I mean, make you have to make sure that it is digital as much as possible, so as to incorporate that information. You need to observe that letter, how much of that information that you're collecting for a particular SME, is it verified or unverified? If the information that you're capturing is unverified, there is a risk. So try and manage the percentage of what is your verified versus non-verified information. You would observe that some of the information that you've captured has a very, very high statistical relevance versus those others who are not. So slowly, there needs to be a linkage between the statistical way you are managing information that, let's say, out of 17 pieces of information that you're collecting in an SME, we have only observed that five to be very, very potent from a risk standpoint, the other 12 are not. Out of the other 12, someone, some, some of the information could be relevant for, let's say, KYC and for regulatory standpoint, but let's say the other five out of the 17 or other six out of the 17 are irrelevant, at least from a decisioning standpoint it makes sense to drop them. You don't need to, let's say, burden your systems in capturing those five pieces of additional information that you are never using for your underwriting. What also makes sense is that if there's a new variable that you believe could add value, you should add it back by replacing those other five so that you can mine the data later on to see that whether it is adding any value or not. Uh, what is also relevant from a data standpoint is the plethora of data that you're collecting. Right. So if I'm an SME and if I apply to you tomorrow, you must get my, you, I mean, I'm filling technically my application form. I'm giving you my bank statement. You are pulling my bureau data along with my bureau score, both at an individual level and at a company level. You don't know. Let's say the individual risk might, may be very, very high and the score might be very poor while the company score is still, let's say, in nascent stage and okay. How do you deal with cases where, let's say, uh, I as a promoter individually have a very, very poor credit history, but my company is very good or vice versa. So, so, so this needs to be taken into account. Then comes GST where, let's say, you need to get the GST data both at underwriting and, let's say, while you are monitoring the account so as to make sure that you are uh, looking at the way the sales is moving or whether the guy is paying tax or not and what is the let's say the constant monitoring that you would do after you underwrite an SME is very, very relevant to the GST data. So that needs to be incorporated. So data is critical and you need to make sure that you take GST, credit bureau, banking statement and application form 
for sure while you're underwriting. These are mostly digital and they would allow you to underwrite in the most effective way once you are uh, you know, using the intelligence on the top of it to do so. And then once you have a tick mark to against all the data pieces, you're pushing them to segmentation, you're pushing them to a scorecard and so on. Uh, sorry about that. You're pushing them to a scorecard and then eventually a decision uh, to, 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 to take care of them in that particular form. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> all that I spoke about in the last page is basically where you are making your procedures standardized. You're moving from a manual to an automated or a semi-automated mode. You are lowering your TAT. Uh, you are able, you are putting a better monitoring and a regular monitoring of your, let's say, uh, status, application status. Uh, you are moving from a subjective evaluation to an objective. So uh, again, um, uh, I have a point here where, let's say on the SMEs, there's a lot of manual underwriting that happens, right? You can, let's say, sit down with all your senior underwriters and ask for what do you do in general to underwrite a loan. And if you do A, B, C, D, E to underwrite a loan, there is, there should not technically be any complication of creating rules out of what the manual underwriters do in any case. And that should be a phase-wise approach where you are trying to automate the manual part into much more objective and recognizable part than what this report. <clears throat> so, I mean, the integration needs to be, I mean, uh, we, you have to have an integration with those systems. That is what the basic purpose of automation is. So streamlining and transformation of application processing is relevant. And let's say I'm not stating something new. Uh, but 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 I mean just that we tick mark more or less all the elements from uh, data collection from an integration to systems and to a monitoring standpoint and where you're providing the right decision and you're able to streamline it. So what we recommend, let's say, given of what I have been talking about uh, and, and which is nothing new, but these are key decision modules that we have seen across our projects across. Uh, you need to have a decision control. There needs to be a proper document management. Uh, the credit memo that you're putting in has to be like consolidated in the right place. User and role management needs to be there. The business rules needs to be clear that you're not declining needlessly. There has to be a risk segmentation, which is statistically driven. There has to be a scorecard, which is statistically driven. And the data integration from from a workflow standpoint needs to exist for you to let's say lend in the best possible form so i mean um, i mean we are moving from really let's say where uh, we had a manual gear or everything was let's say, manual to automated ways where it does the same thing but let's say <clears throat> which would add a lot of efficiency where your volumes would still keep up now the question is that would you do you need to do a lot of these things uh, where your volume is low versus where it makes sense to do these things where the volume is high. I mean, we would want to bet that even while your volume is low for some high ticket loans, and when I talk about high ticket, the grid is very, very big. And let's say as we saw in India, the range is from 10 lakhs to 5 crores. We would want you to increase your volumes where you have that capacity. And this is the only way you can get more capacity by, by doing this. So the, 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 the point is that so I'm turning off my webcam. There is a slow network warning sign coming up to me. Uh, so I hope that's okay. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, so this is the key solution that we recommend. Nothing spectacular, but something which is very, very robust from a structural standpoint. And the way it would benefit you is that, let's say, it would capture the different angles in the right way and do justice to the information that you're collecting. So right from your application where you're getting all the SME data, where we are getting the data from your existing client system, 
where you are getting to the bureau, where you are getting to the financials, the banking statement, GST, or let's say the uh, PNL that they gave. If there is a need of side fit, are you also uh, reviewing and so and using some intelligence for the side visit as well? And let's say there can be some qualitative as well, where you are interviewing, let's say, a promoter, and which is there for some high ticket loans that you are distributing. So the point is that if you are going qualitative, if you are doing site visit, financial bureau application, everything must be saved and everything must be used in the right way, digitally, and with a statistical intelligence coming on the top of it. So if I put everything together in terms of how it works and how does it, let's say, so basically you would have, let's say the customer engagement, where you're collecting some basic information, then there is a pre-screening. Then after the pre-screening, let's say you are collecting some additional data and then it is your credit review and approval process and then, then your disbursement. So let's say it's five sentences now. Um, so once we break it up, let's say into these five steps, um, who is doing what in this? What are the things that they're doing and where would it work and how would it work? I think these are the key questions that we would always get, right? So from a customer engagement and a pre-screening and initial segmentation standpoint, the relationship manager is going to get terms of basic information. So uh, also collecting the basic product data that is there. Then there is an automatic layer that picks up into where it applies the policy, it, uh, it applies, let's say, the public data or the uh, private data that is there. It would compute the application score and it would pull the credit bureau. So all this, let's say, should flow in a relatively seamless manner from an engagement and a pre-screening and initial segmentation standpoint. Then you would go into additional data computation after you do this, no? So basically you would look at financial information, qualitative assessment, then you would compute scores for each of the assessments that you're doing, and then you're going to augment, let's say, the application score or the uh, thinking of, of for that particular study. And uh, for sure, in this additional data collection, GST and banking data has to come in. Apart from, let's say, the site visit, apart from uh, the... Uh, financial information that you're looking at of course financial information is also can be very very dubious let's say for smes no so we need to have other data sources just to make sure it it, it it works then comes the point of what is the credit limit and the pricing and the tenure okay so hardly we get into a risk-based pricing hardly we get into let's say what could be the more optimized credit limit and the term of the loan that we give so we can have an optimizer schedule run in order to decide the best limit, the best pricing, the best tenure, because they're all in the link in the way the cash flows is going to come in to, uh, to maximize your profitability by also taking in to the risk that is considered. So what we typically do and what you should do as well is look at the profitability of a particular SME at different combinations of this, incorporating the credit risk of that is being recognized and then choose the one pricing the tenure and the limit which is more optimized for a particular <clears throat> uh, sme that you're doing again if you have collateral collateral is not going to go away let's say for a large part of uh, the loans then you need to define them let's say in a way which is slightly more helpful to the customers versus that you're not i mean <clears throat> let's say i mean i'm just giving a simple example no um you, you, you there are two guys who comes for a loan, one of them have a low risk, one of them have a high risk. I mean, given that you have already recognized that the risk of one guy is low by whatever mechanism you have, it could be that you also relax the collateralized rule for them versus the other. I mean, there is nothing that, let's say, stops us in re-engineering the way we are thinking about collaterals, right? Because I think this is something that is impacting them very well. And I think if you are able to position it in a way which is linked to risk and helps the, the SME, why not? So things like this.
uh, and then eventually you have an automatic application decision and let's say you can eventually also tag an account whether you would want to do a cross sell or an upsell immediately based on the way you're getting the data uh, and then a customer response. Uh, I'm seeing some questions in the chat window. Uh, if okay, I will finish this and I will ask, uh, I'll answer all of them together. Okay. So I see the question from Tushar. Tushar, just, just I mean, we are just left with a couple of pages and then I'll get back to your question. Thanks. Okay. And then once we decide all this, then uh, we finally go to the decision engine to give the decision. And then uh, if there is a manual review that is required by, by a credit appraiser, uh, and then there is a manual change of everything that the system decided by the credit appraiser, we need to take care of that, where eventually the response goes back to the customer relationship manager or the uh, SME itself. And then you go on in generating the dispersed documents, accept and sign contract and uh, finalize the necessary disbursements, and then digitally save the application back to the LOS or your core banking system. So I think this needs to be, and I am more in favor, I mean, of here, if you look at the credit appraiser of automating this as well, as much as possible, not the full one, because you cannot ever, but if I am doing this, for 60% of the cases, I believe we can recognize what those 60% of the cases are and automate the manual underwriting by some rules. And it is, I'm not saying this purely as a theory. We have done this and it has given a huge benefit, not only in freeing up time for the underwriters to look at cases which are more complicated and give it more time. And also, let's say, standardize what they do in a meaningful way. <clears throat> and then, of course, the final disbursements. So if I recap, let's say, effective risk assessment by applying multiple scorecards, there is no uh, uh, replacement of this. You have to. I mean, you have to have to have multiple scorecards for decision support. This is, let's say, the bare minimum you can go into. Uh, the second is, increase onboarding and profitability while maintaining current credit risk level. So our recommendation is that do whatever in trying to increase your approval rate, but by maintaining the same level of risk. Once you engineer all this, do not, I mean, you are comfortable with the current level of risk in any case. So try and do everything in maintaining the level of risk that you have, which are comfortable with, let's say, as your PNL uh, statements, as your future projections are from a loss provisioning standpoint, maintain that, but then increase uh, because let's say this is already budgeted in your system in one way that you're going to take up a credit loss of this extent, take up that credit loss to that extent, and then try and increase the business. Very difficult. Point number three is very, very difficult. Uh, for this, you need to really know what is the tag today by looking at the timestamp of when the first application came in, what you did in the middle, blah, 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 and then to your dispersal. So we recommend that you increase the, of the tag by at least 60%, at least. And, and, and by automating multiple things that you're doing. Implement multiple processes for different clients, segment products, and risk levels. This is easy once you do one to three. Uh, because all you need to do, since they're modular, you all you need to do is replicate that for multiple products that you're looking at now, or multiple segments. So start with one segment, maybe, because it is much more definable, it is much more clear to you what you need to do. Test it out. Once you see success, then roll it out to the other products. Uh, there is nothing, I mean, you all know this, but my only perspective and point is I have seen multiple peer players who are taking the data, but not using them to the extent. I mean, uh, so the point is that let's say uh, uh, you buy a three liter engine 
uh, with a two wheel drive with a four wheel drive but hardly your rpm goes above 3000 or hardly you use the four wheel drive for anything i mean uh, it, it needs to it needs to be there because you do have the power you do have the you do have the engine to really ramp up uh, uh, right now but let's say the usage of that in the best possible way is sometimes not seen so this would be my uh, five recommendations let's say to manage your core systems and i still recommend invest in your core systems that is what makes sense uh, in the best possible form for SME lending. I think that's all uh, from my side. I will go to the questions that have come uh, and I'll try to do justice in answering them. Uh, I was told by uh, Almas, who is organizing the seminar, to make sure I switch on my webcam uh, when I answer questions because that's relevant. So I don't know if you can see me again. So I hope you can. Um, so uh, okay. So I am seeing. So okay. So the first question I see from uh, Tushar: In an economic downturn like the one we face now, how would a lender push unsecured credit to the SME sector other than government guaranteed credit limits? So uh, as I said, uh, Tushar, I mean you would not want to touch the travel industry. But let's say there are other supply chain on the grocery side. There are other uh, players who are working on, uh, let's say, the agri side. There are other players who are working on the manufacturing side. They will not go bust, right? They are still there. Uh, maybe let's say the, the the SMEs who are working on festivals like Ganpati Bappa or Durga Puja in West Bengal, there can be a hit given that people might not go. But there are some other SMEs that would continue. So there are industries that you pick that you would lend and there are industries that you pick that you would not lend. I think that is clear and going to come from your macroeconomic overview of how the industry is impacted. Once you take the decision that, okay, this industry I'm not going to touch and this industry I'm going to touch, you need the five points that I recap right now to be the main instruments in targeting them. And this is not only for now. What I'm trying to say is that this is forever. Uh, and COVID is not forever, for sure. And we all know that in some way or the other. So we might do a lot of things in thinking that, oh, we need to build a spectacular system to underwrite for COVID. My, 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 my thoughts are you don't. You need to do exactly what you've been doing from a lending practice forever. And you need to invest in the core system as it is. And you need to just decide that these are the industries that you don't need to touch. And these are the industries that you need to touch. Um, the, there's a second question from Tushar, also sectoral overlays on credit scorecard will discourage credit to the most uh, uh, need sectors and be counterproductive to SME credit push. So, of course, so let's say if you are doing an overlay on, uh, let's say, where you are changing a cutoff. So, how do you do an overlay? No, you can decide that, let's say, I today I was approving 50% of the population, tomorrow I'll approve only 20%, the 20 best. So, you're approving the 50 best. Tomorrow, you are approving the 20 best by changing your cutoff. You are switching off, let's say, travel and uh, let's say uh, seasonal SME uh, 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 micro players who get into that. So, so for those industries that you are not switching off, maintain uh, the core lending practice that you are doing, but invest in these five things if they are not there. With respect to specific rules that are there for each industry, given that there can be changes in cash supply because the cash flow is already also impacted, right? Uh, you can optimize their payment structure, their term, their tenure in a way which is much more conducive. I mean, it could be that, let's say, you restructure the loan in a way where you're giving a new one that is not restructuring, you're giving our loan in a way where the EMI burden is let's say a step up so i mean you can play with let's say uh, different things because we are trying to assess two things no we are trying to assess uh, intent to pay and we are trying to assess ability to pay on the intent to pay clearly if you are able to prove that the intent exists but the ability to pay is impaired so you need to optimize the tenure the loan amount and the pricing 
in a way which makes the ability to be conducive for the player. I think uh, that is what is needed to support the SME lending at this particular juncture. Chris has multiple scoring models uh, depending on different uh, uh, industries or uh, different uh, SMEs that you're trying to target. So, of course, it can be integrated. Uh, I mean, uh, and, and that is true also where, let's say, uh, it can be customized for the segment that you are going for. So, uh, I mean, that is there. Uh, then there is a question without someone, what is the impact of COVID on SME segment? I mean, the impact is big, no? I mean, because all the SMEs have been impacted. There is no doubt about that. But some industries more than the other. So decide very clearly which industries you're going to lend and which industries you're going to not. Those industries that you're going to lend, and this is a business decision, no? This has nothing to do with your systems and uh, places and your risk scorecards and your so and so forth. Once you decide these industries that you're going to lend, Build a very, very solid system with all the components that I was mentioning to help you to assess the risk in the best possible way. How the aspect of deviations can be incorporated in automated process? So this is a question from Hariharan K. So thanks for the question, Hariharan. Uh, so as I was mentioning, let's so let's say if I'm a manual underwriter and I see that if my uh, revenue in general have uh, increased 20% every year despite some challenges in uh, cash flows i am okay as a manual underwriter to approve this particular application in general that is the rule that i use and i've seen that rule to be helpful so what you need to do is that talk to all your manual underwriters and ask them okay if these are the kind of profiles what are the actions do you usually take so let's say manual underwriter so, so so let's say you have 10 underwriters underwriter one says okay i take this five decisions underwriter two says i take these three decisions because there's a variation no as well as the way the underwriter would see a particular case depending on his or her experience so you take a download of all the five or six treatments that different underwriters do then you create a policy out of it and you place the policy on and are you automated and we have done it and it works beautifully in not only releasing time for underwriters to make sure they look at high profile cases but at the same time um, it also allows you significant cost savings and also improves your turnaround time of loan processing Uh, will quantitative will qualitative parameters in the risk scorecard take a higher weightage towards SME lending in an economic downturn? So what I was mentioning, Tushar, is that uh, it will not. Your core system will remain as it is. So let's say if there was no COVID, you would have developed a scorecard one on bureau, a scorecard two your application data, a scorecard three of your banking data, a scorecard four on your GST data, and policies on each of the data. Keep those as is don't change them then on the top of that you put whatever qualitative parameters that you need to to just highlight the areas that you would want to avoid so imagine a core system running and then on the core system imagine a covid overlay the covid overlay could be based on multiple parameters based on a specific use case that you're looking at so whatever the COVID overlay is that, the COVID overlay would stop you from lending or exposing yourself to a particular industry or to a particular category of uh, lenders. Once the COVID crisis is over, you also need to think of how to go back to a system which can immediately backfire and uh, immediately fire and do normal underwriting. So the way you need to design the system is that make sure both stay separate, your COVID and your core logic and your COVID overlay, and you can switch off the COVID overlay clearly because you don't, you, what is also relevant to everyone is that uh, since underwriting is more or less stopped, the demand as it picks up will be humongous. 
you need to manage the search and the companies that are able to manage the search in the best possible way would also do a lot of business so i mean it's it's a very screwed up time right now i mean and there is very limited that you can do in a screwed up time but at least my recommendation is to be ready for when let's say uh, the good times or the proper times or the covid period is going away you are very very ready and your systems are ready your uh, your systems are agile to manage that search so that is what i would recommend my mouth has gone dry sorry i mean uh, can we open up the audio uh, to everyone i mean if someone has to ask a question it's okay i mean i'm tired i mean it's very difficult for you to solo speak and not hear any other voice i mean if that's okay or we can go ahead with text Thank you, Pooja. I think uh, we are nearly over time, are we? Sorry, if someone has a question, you can ask. Uh, I don't know how much time uh, is left. Oh, we have five minutes left. Okay, uh, I have a question. Sorry, we're getting a lot of background noise. Uh, from Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, hear you. Um, in the middle of the day, Krifel and Orkin, Credit Bureau. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 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 I am uh, really sorry I need to interrupt you. I cannot uh, really uh, hear the question because uh, Open up the audio with and then let's say uh, on the keyboards. Yeah, I think it's best that you send the uh, questions to uh, uh, thing, uh, and we will get back to you or we will reach out to you to answer your question. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we're on the call again. So, uh, we can we just wanted to get an understanding that if the uh, internet has to move from uh, I think uh, we are getting multiple uh, different time of questions, but that's okay. I think send the. Uh, I think I got a question from Pooja since there is some time left. Uh, we are funding to no income proof customer profile. Okay, this is interesting. How to access the uh, the TO level of NIP cases? Because uh, I don't know what NIP means. Uh, what do you mean by NIP? NIP. Are not maintaining the proper books or oh no income something okay because of the COVID are not run from the last four months okay so I think um, 
you need to assess their bureau you need to their assess their pre covid scenario uh, and you need to assess uh, even if there is no income there are ways to circumvent that uh, i think uh, if the industry is okay where the industry volume is picking up and you might seek for recent industry information i think it is still okay to to look at their current leverage and let's say uh, by looking at their current leverage that they have and let's say any fresh proof of business that they are doing i think it can be taken forward it should not let's say be a full deterrent to stop completely uh, lending to these customers uh, given that they are not able to give uh, income proof for the recent period got it got it i got the no income proof yeah i mean i assume the no income proof is for this period right now uh, previously they did have a income proof where they were they were in business and uh, i mean and let's say if you consider that period of a business to be good i mean this is also a time that they need the credit so i mean if if, if let's say their bureau if if different information as i mentioned before as a recap is more or less allowing you to uh do so then you can so the question is that is script capturing any alternate data on sme founders including those in sme scorecards so i mean the so CRIF has two entities, uh, CRIF Highmark, which is a credit bureau, which is collecting all the information on the promoters and their companies if they take a lending. Um, we do not, let's say, take out any alternate information because we are not in the lending business, but we can help you in structuring it in the framework that I mentioned or that I discussed. All right, I think we are over time. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, really appreciated your time. Thank you. Bye-bye.